Hey everyone, thanks for uh, stopping by and checking out our webinar. This week what I want to talk about is relative rotation graphs or RRGs. Now RRGs are a fantastic way of being able to take a whole group of securities and view them all on one chart in a relative strength um, uh, manner or type of, uh, of calculation. Now, if you've not been doing relative strength, let me just give you a, a quick sort of introduction to that. Uh, if you are managing a portfolio and you are being judged against a benchmark, what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to load up your portfolio with securities that are outperforming the benchmark. Uh, because then, you know, by uh, uh, extension, your portfolio is going to outperform uh, that benchmark. Now, typically, if you've got clients and you're investing their money, they're sitting there every day looking at returns that you're getting for them or returns that you're getting for your own portfolio and judging that against what's happened to the S&P last night. And so it's very common, for instance, to um, be benchmarking your portfolio against the S&P 500. Now, the RRG is a great way of being able to do that. So what I'm going to do is just a couple of uh, quick slides. Now, I know some of you who may be watching this have seen a lot of the theory before, and so I don't want to take too long on this, but just so that um, for those who may be new to this, I want to take five minutes explaining how the RRGs work, and then what I want to do is talk about stock selection using RRG and also portfolio management using RRG. And then we'll talk about some of the other more wilder concepts as well that we've been working on here at Optima. All right, so let's just get started with these uh, slides here. RIGs were developed by Julius de Campenaer. He's a, well, at the time, he was a sell-side analyst in the Netherlands. And he was explaining to me that what he had was often he'd be going to visit portfolio managers or his clients, and he'd be talking to them about um, different securities, and they'd be saying, well, gee, should I be using Google or should I be buying Microsoft? And you, know, you could look at them from a relative comparison. You could say, well, yes, Google's outperforming the S&P or Microsoft's outperforming, but how much are they outperforming? So you remember that a relative comparison calculation is taking the price of the security and dividing it by the index. And so you've got that, um, that number, but that number is actually meaningless. It's just a ratio, not even a proper ratio, it's just a calculation between the stock and the index. So what Julius did, which was absolutely groundbreaking in this industry, was that he went and found a way to normalize all of these uh, calculations, but then also create the rotation graph. So that not only could we see from a relative strength point of view, but we could also then view relative momentum. And so as he did this, he created this chart that we look and you can see the, the colored chart here. And this is very typical you'll see on any RRG, this type of um, setup. Now, as we go through um, all the different uh, quadrants there, I'm sort of jumping ahead on my slide. So let me jump to this one. So let's just say we've got a security here up in the leading quadrant and we've got our benchmark in the middle. This is the way I like to visualize it is that the benchmark is in the center of the chart and I'm looking at my securities. Are they outperforming? Are they underperforming? So by being in the green quadrant, this security is leading or outperforming the SPX. And so what that means, and again, another great analogy I like to use is imagine that the SPX is this great big truck driving down the highway and the security is just a sedan driving next to it. What's happening here is that the speed, the speed of the car or the sedan next to the truck is a relative speed. You know, they're both doing, let's say 60 miles an hour down the highway, but the car is pulling away because it has relatively more speed or it's out, outperforming or outspeeding the truck. That's what's happening in the leading quadrant. There is an outperformance. Now, you know, when Julius talks about it, he talks about um, relative strength, uh, sorry, relative trend or positive relative trend, which is a, a form of outperformance. So uh, that's why, you know, we talk about that here. Um, as we go around the quadrant, you can see now the security is in weakening. Again, using our analogy of the truck and the car. This is a scenario where the car is out in front. It's been outperforming, 
but what's happening now is it's starting to slow down and the, and the truck is starting to catch up. So on a historical basis, it actually is still outperforming the index, but it's not quite as strong. It's not pulling away anymore and that index is starting to catch up. As we keep going around, we have the lagging quadrant. Now, as you can start to imagine, here is where the index is out in front, the uh, security is falling behind and getting further and further behind. And so again, the car's being left behind on the track uh, on the highway there. And then finally, the last quadrant here is the improving quadrant. Now, this is where we have our security way behind the index. But what's happening now is it's showing relative strength. It's starting, to, its trend has improved, and so it's starting to catch up again to that truck. So again, on a historical basis, you may look at it and say, that security is not outperforming the index. Why would I put that in my portfolio? But on a relative trend, and what it's starting to tell you is that, hang on, it's starting to catch up. You know, I can get in early here and add this to my portfolio before it is obvious that it's outperforming the market. And that is where a lot of the usage of what we're talking about with RIG and the, the charts, that's a lot of where this centers on. And so if we um, have a look, you know, as Julius did this work, what he found is that there is this very predominant, obvious clockwise rotation that is going on in, in the RIGs. And we'll show you that as well with some of the charts that we bring up. So again, this is obviously a webinar that I wanna show you how you can use Optima to be able to um, take advantage of these type of um, strategies, how you can um, find stocks to add or ETFs or securities. This isn't just limited to stocks. You know, there's a number of different things that you can do um, with your um, RIG charts, with all sorts of securities, etc. Um, so what we'll do, let's just jump in and we'll get rid of those slides. We don't need that anymore. And let's go have a look at the software. So the first thing that uh, I want to really cover is this whole concept of stock selection. So let's just say that um, we're going to deal with equities, but you know, we could deal with anything. Now, for this one, I'm using Bloomberg data um, and I'm talking about a lot of the more professional um, features that are available in RIG. If you don't have all of these features in your copy of Optima, just talk to us uh, because they are available uh, and we can make those available to you. So just let us know about that. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna hit F3 on my keyboard to bring up the security selector. The way I like to start with this one is I'm just gonna go to Bloomberg and I'm gonna start out at the uh, GIX level one sectors. Now we've got a few of these groups here. Uh, if there's a group that you're looking for that's not available, just again, let us know. Uh, what I want to do is I wanna open this list, open the folder here as a RRG. So what we've got in front of us is that rotation graph that we talked about there, and we've got all of these arrows. Now, each of these arrows here, let me make these lines just a little bit uh, tail style. I wanna make the lines a little bit fatter for you. Uh, so that we can see those a little bit better there. And let's make the labels a bit bigger too. So it's all just a little bit clearer on your screen there. Uh, one last change I wanna make is I wanna change the colors of the labels to match the arrows. So with an RIG and with these arrows, what we're looking here is 10 data points. Now the arrow is the most uh, recent position on the rotation graph. So the rate remembering, are we leading, are we lagging, et cetera. The tail is the history. And you'll see as we look along, you'll see these bumps uh, or these dots uh, at each point. That's where that value was, let's say one period back. In this case, I'm looking at a daily chart, so it'll be one day back or two days back, three days back, et cetera. So what I can see is, all right, financials is outperforming um, the S&P and the rest of the, uh, the S&P 500 at this point, but where's it been? Where's it come from? And it's really important to know where things have come from because it really helps us get an idea of where we can make a prediction, if you like, about where it's going to go. 
So we're looking at this chart here. Actually, let's just go back. And I'm just going to show you. We'll go back. This one goes back a year. Uh, and if we scroll through time, you'll start to see that predominant clockwise rotation that happens on a relative rotation graph. It's not a guarantee. You're not going to get uh, a perfect rotation every time. Uh, you know, if we just look here now at the, uh, the financial right here, you can see that it does a little bit of a, a wiggle up and down. You know, it doesn't know what it's doing at this point. And that's very indicative of some sort of news event that's happened and causing a bit of a shock. But there's a couple of things that I've noticed in looking at RIGs, and that is that when you've got those spacings far apart, so for instance, if I'm looking here, you know, at this materials in the history, I would say that these dots are fairly far apart. When that happens, the likelihood of a U-turn or a, a hook turn or something like that happening is very, very low. Typically, it, you could almost call it like relative momentum in some respect. The arrow has momentum and it's going to continue going on. But as they slow down, let's go back to where Financial did that hook. So we're coming in here. If you look at Financial over here, we're coming in. I'll just use the arrows on my keyboard. And you can see now that we've got very, very little momentum. There's little conviction about where that's going. And that is typically when I've seen these types of things where the arrows go back and forth all over the place. Here the arrows turned around uh, and then turned around again and went back. So these are things to watch out for. You know, I'm looking for very convincing moves. That whole time, you can look at material. Material was just so convincing in that same period of time there. So we've got these arrows. You can see the rotation, etc. So let's just go and jump right back to the end. I want to zoom out a little bit. Actually, the other great thing about this is if you've ever done any study on intermarket analysis, um, let me just quickly jump over here. Um, John Murphy uh, with stockcharts.com, he's done a lot of really great work on intermarket analysis. This book here is one that I would highly recommend. Uh, it's, it's one of the best that I've read on the topic. Uh, but what he talks about in his material is this whole concept of you've got the stock market cycle uh, in red here, and then you've got the green uh, economic cycle. And there are always sectors that perform better at different points in the whole market cycle or the whole business cycle. And it doesn't mean, so if we looked at this one here and said, okay, if we are, let's just say that we are at the point where the economic cycle is starting to lift, we're starting to go into a, a, a new phase of economic expansion. I know there's a lot of people who disagree, but uh, we'll come back and explain why we think that might be the case. Um, but you'd look at energy and say, it doesn't mean that energy has been outperforming. What John Murphy's saying here is that from this point on, energy, if this is where we are in the, in the um, cycle, then we would expect energy to outperform going forward. And that's why this is really great. And the more that I've looked at this, you know, of course, as with every theory, you know, there's always going to be cases where you can say, no, it didn't work. Uh, but this is one where I've seen it work time and time again. Now, why do I bring that up in the context of RIG? Let me change from a daily RIG where we're looking at daily points and go to a monthly RIG. So I need to zoom out because this is all much, much bigger. Um, and where we are right now uh, with this, with the last almost year of history, uh, what we can see is energy has been outperforming really badly, been in the lagging, been left behind by all the other quadrants. But look where it's now. It's actually gone into the improving quadrant. So what that tells me is that we're in an environment where energy is starting to do better uh, and, and looks like it's going to follow on and outperform the, uh, the rest of the S&P there. Materials is doing well. Uh, what else have we got here? Consumer discretionary has turned down, utilities has turned down, infotech has turned down. So again, if we come back to this diagram, infotech or technology, you know, 
it had been outperforming, but now that's over uh, and it's, it's out, um, turned down. Industrials, healthcare, finance, etc. So this is just a great thing to study. Taking an RIG on a monthly basis at a sector level really makes this sort of stuff come alive. Uh, and it's, it's very, very powerful. All right, so we've got this, and let's just say, I'm gonna jump back to a daily um, for this one. Let's just say we've been looking at that, like the look of energy, um, and say, right, I wanna know what stocks can I add to my, my um, portfolio? Well, with the Bloomberg one, I can come along in here and I can say, right, let's display the index members. So what we've got here is all the energy stocks uh, that are part of the S&P 500 Energy Index. Uh, and you can see here at the top uh, that this one is actually already automatically, Optima's automatically set the uh, S5 Energy Sector as the, uh, the benchmark there. So we can look at this and say, well, which ones are the best ones? So, because I wanna add the, the best ones to my portfolio. And again, it's almost like this fractal nature that we see in so many areas of technical analysis where you know, what we've done at a macro level starts working as we go down and down into um, subsequent levels. What I'm gonna do actually is just shorten the tail length here just to get rid of a little bit of the noise. And again, what I'm looking for is things over in heading into the improving quadrant um, so that I can pick up on that relative strength earlier. And so there may be things here, you know, I can look at, um, you know, I'm not even gonna pronounce all these names, but there's very, there's all these different resource companies that I could be looking at and then doing further investigation. So from a stock selection point of view, I mean, I could have, got, could have gone to sub levels if there were a number of industry groups. Maybe I wanted to look at the different industry groups and say, well, which do I think is the best? Um, or in this case, as I said, we just went straight into all the um, equities and had a look at those. The other thing we can do um, with this is start to have a look at um, how far away are they from the center of the chart. You see, again, I can be looking at this and I can have um, uh, you know, a lot of these equities and looking at their relative strength against the benchmark but sometimes you get a industry like telecoms where you've got AT&T and Verizon, which are the absolute heavyweights. And they, they just stay centered around and there's so little movement around the index because they contribute so much to that index. But then you've got other ones like T-Mobile and Sprint, which are way out on the periphery. Now, what we found is that the further stocks are away from the benchmark on the RRG chart, the more opportunity there is for alpha over the index. And it makes sense when you think about it because as the um, stock and it has such a big impact on the index, then as the stock goes up, well, the index is going up with it. But if I'm dealing with a stock that has little impact on the index and has a lower um, capitalization, then as the stock starts outperforming, well, it has the opportunity to really outperform and, and give us a lot of alpha um, over the index. And when I look at this chart here on the energy stocks, I'm seeing the same thing. So any one of these stocks here, ExxonMobil, you know, you of course, it's the second or third largest company on the S&P. Uh, you expect that to be near the middle because it contributes so much to the, um, uh, the energy sector and, and the sector index. Whereas out here, Southwestern Energy, that would be one that I'd be interested in, especially if I was looking for alpha. Maybe not so much now, it's starting to get a little bit long in the tooth already, um, but these are the types of things that I'm looking for. And there's actually a really nice feature here is that we can actually put on a feature uh, where we have a standard deviation um, circle. So I could actually make that two standard deviations. And what we've done is we've taken the average of all of the data points and said, well, if we know what the average is of how far away they are from the origin, then let's take a uh, standard deviation of that and let's get rid of the first couple of standard deviations because we know that the most alpha is going to come out of those ones that are around on the periphery. 
And so we can just focus on those when we're adding them or removing them from our portfolio. So a couple of things there which are beneficial. The other thing I want to talk about is how we actually manage a portfolio um, using RRG. So again, I can come along here now last week, if you didn't watch last week's webinar, it should still be on the page uh, there at ProWeb, uh, optima.com slash ProWeb, you can have a look at that. But what we can do uh, now is we can open up a watch list, a symbol list. So I'm just gonna hit F3 on my keyboard and go to my symbol lists. And we covered this last week. Here is a list of about 100 securities that um, I have on uh, using Bloomberg. Uh, works with it with um, anything uh, that we have there. Uh, and I'm gonna open this list. First of all, I wanna open it as a um, uh, watch list. I just wanted to bring that through there, uh, just so you can see all the codes that we've got. And then I've got this little feature at the top of a watch list where I can open these groups. Now I could group this by sector and have a look at the sectors individually. Uh, but in this case, what I wanna do, because I wanna manage my whole portfolio, I just wanna open the whole lot. So let's just go and open that as an RRG and that will all come up there. And again, with 100 equities showing 10 days of uh, data, it's a little bit long, so let's just shorten all of that. Now the software automatically creates these with um, auto, uh, random colors. So each arrow, color means nothing. Let me just get that label size back up again so we can see a little bit of that, make that a bit clearer for you and I'm gonna change that to the tail color so we can link them up with their arrows. So we've got these on the charts, but from a portfolio perspective, this doesn't help me. You know, if I'm looking at my portfolio, I wanna know, gee, are there any equities here or is there anything in my portfolio that I need to take action on? I don't know if you remember from last time, but let's just go back to this F3. I wanna show you this. I wanna open up the CSV file again from this uh, list of securities. Because what I did in here is I've got two extra columns. And now look, these numbers are made up, um, but you know you could be working with this. Again, uh, you bring in a portfolio from Bloomberg, all of this stuff automatically comes in. But what we can set up is we've got the weight in let's say my portfolio, and we've got the weight in the benchmark. And so that way I can, the software can actually calculate active weight um, for any one of these securities. Now, you may just have, do I own it? Am I long and have a value of one? Am I short, have a value of minus one? Uh, and then you don't even need a benchmark because the benchmark's uh, assumed to be zero. So you can have like this one, zero, minus one option as well, and it will give you uh, exactly what we're going to show. But this is where all of this information's coming from. So because I've got that, what I can do with my RIG is I can come along and say, well, I don't wanna color randomly here in color style. I actually wanna color by fund weight. And now what's happened is anything that I have a long position in will be colored green. Anything that, I, that I'm short on, or sorry, underweight. So in this case, I'm talking about um, active weight. So if I'm overweight, the benchmark, it's green. If I'm underweight, it's red. If I'm neutral or equal weighted within a percent, then it's going to be blue. And what I'm trying to do here is again, is just have that concept of as things are big showing relative strength, I want, to, I want to overweight them. I want to get in early. You know, one of the, uh, the great things that I love about the work of Tom Dorsey at Dorsey Wright is he does this relative comparison um, with point and figure charts. So he takes point and figure charts and he basically says, if I divide IBM by Microsoft and the, rel and the um, point and figure of that value starts posting crosses, meaning that it's going up, then it gets a positive score in our ranking system. A lot more complex than that, but essentially what he's doing is he's picking up really early uh, that there is relative strength building. And so he's able to give that a positive score when most people who would be looking at it would be saying, oh, it's underperforming, it's been underperforming for three months and it's gonna continue to underperform. 
I don't know about you, but uh, many times I've sat with financial professionals who um, have taken great joy at pointing out, here is a fund that has outperformed for the last year. You know, I think we should be moving your money or your investments into that fund. And really what all of this analysis is telling us is that usually by the time that happens, it is too late. You know, that ship has already sailed and all you're doing is just getting in and buying off the smart money that's starting to sell. And in our uh, website at optima.com slash research, uh, there's a white paper that I wrote on that. So if you're very interested in this material, uh, have a read of that. It's all, I think it's titled something like, um, uh, Buy buying outperformers is too late. So do check that out uh, for a little bit more on that whole theory. What I'm trying to do with this chart here is I want to make sure that my portfolio is weighted towards that. Then what happens is that as time goes on, and let's just go back uh, a little bit of time here. So let's just say that um, uh, I'm looking at this type of scenario. This would be, be terrible from my portfolio management point of view, but nevertheless, I'm looking here and let's say um, this range resources company. Um, what I've got here is I'm looking at it, it is negative, it's pointing in the wrong direction. Now that's a concept that we haven't talked about yet. There's so many concepts here with RRGs. The direction of the arrow is actually really important. When I first started working with RRGs, I was thinking that maybe it's all to do with just where it is, because I, I wanted to systemize it and I wanted to test it. And that again is what that white paper goes a lot into. So I was looking and saying, well, if I buy at this angle and sell at that angle, maybe I'd get good results. What we found is that we get much better results when we pay attention to the heading of the arrows, not just where they are on the graph. Uh, you know, and, and another great example of that is this one FTI right here. You know, it's starting to point back up again. So it may not do a full rotation, but it's starting to point back up again, showing relative outperformance and, and relative strength. The, the trend is becoming positive again. So we want to jump on that one as well. So by doing that, we were able to get some really nice results and you can read about that in that paper. So again, I can look at this from a PM point of view and say, what am I doing that's green? Why am I long um, RRC here? Uh, maybe I better go and action it. The point is, I don't have to go through all my equities, all my securities every day, looking to see, gee, do I need to change a position? If I'm outperforming my benchmark and it's heading in the northeast direction and everything's looking great, well, I can just leave it. I don't need to go and do uh, a lot of analysis. All I need to focus on is those securities that are colored. Let's say I'm, I'm overweight and now it's starting to really point down towards the southwest starting to lag behind uh, or weakening, they're the ones that I want to spend my time analyzing. And so I'm looking at that and, and not spending a lot more time in other areas. So from a portfolio management point of view, that's really, really helpful. The other things that I can do, so let me just show you a quick example here. We can come along and of course, um, as many of you know, Optima is heavily driven on the Optima scripting language. It's a really simple Excel, very Excel-like, but very logical language for uh, writing these things. So the RIG components uh, is JDKRS, uh, and I wanna have a look at the um, angle. Let's just say, uh, sorry, the heading. Let's say the heading, and I want to know is the heading, actually I'm gonna put that in a variable. I'm giving you a, a quick lesson on scripting. If you want to know more about scripting, uh, head over to um, learn.optima.com because we have three courses for, um, which are available on scripting, all for free. So you can get in there and have a look at how the scripting in Optima works. Um, highly recommend them. Our, in our office here, Darren Hawkins has done a fantastic job on that one. Um, so let's just say here, what I've done is I've said, I want that heading to be in J1. I just give it a variable there. So I'm going to now jump in here and say, right, let's say um, I want to know when J1 is greater than, so I've got to think about the compass um, angles here. 
let's say J1 is greater than 270, so I want it heading up from west. I, uh, let me do this the right way for you. So it's spun around and I want to know that the heading is, is heading um, towards the northern hemisphere. So let's just put parentheses around that one quickly. And finally, um, it's got to be greater than 270 uh, or I want it to be, let's say J1 is less than 90. So I just want everything which, which is pointed to the northern hemisphere. Uh, I've done a mistake there. Won't let me save that and now I can apply it. And so now I've got in my watch list uh, this saved condition. And so I can look at that and, and I maybe want to set this up and I can sort that uh, column. Uh, let's go there and I can be working that way if that's easier. So there's a lot of flexibility with the way you set that up. All right, what if you are dealing with a group of securities, let's say a group of ETFs, and it's not immediately obvious what the benchmark would be? You know, I get asked that uh, quite often. There's a point where, again, if you were managing clients' money, I'd be often suggesting to people still use the S&P 500 or in whatever country, the XJO in Australia or the FTSE uh, or the Euro stocks, whatever makes sense for where you are because your clients are going to be judging you against um, one of those indexes. Um, I like the concept on an RRG where every one of these elements is contained in the benchmark and there's not out, outward or outside influences. Because otherwise you can get this situation where maybe there was something big that moved the index um, and all your securities are, are off in a different quadrant and it, it doesn't give you this nice balanced look. But nevertheless, um, using a, a common benchmark is important or you maybe you use a fixed annual rate of return. For instance, on this chart, I could come along here and say, well, instead of using index file, I'm going to use a annual uh, rate of return of 10%. So now instead of being benchmarked against this index, which is going up and down, I'm benchmarked against this straight line 10% return. And again, we can see that we still get rotation that's happening. You know, there's times where everything's outperforming, they're all doing better than 10%, and there's times where everything's going to be underperforming. So you can see how uh, all of that works. So again, it depends on how you're working. Another way which is really important, particularly then if you're dealing with different asset classes, etc., uh, I want to open up another list that I have here. Now this one here is a group of about 100 ETFs, um, all sorts of different, they're bonds, they're um, uh, real estate, all sorts of things in there. And let's again open that. I want to open it straight as an RRG this time. All right, so we've got, again, very long tails. I'm just going to shorten all of that, um, maybe a little bit longer than that. So what we've got are all of these ETFs which are, are running around. Now, actually, in actual fact, this is actually a quite balanced group. But one of the things that we can do in instances where you're dealing with something which it's not so obvious, what should the benchmark be uh, for this group of securities? And that is that we can either take the cap weighted average or the price weighted average. What I'm going to do here is take the price weighted average. And so what the software has done, it's taken all of those data points and created an index that it can use as a benchmark. And it is amazing. So again, we'll go through this. It is amazing how when you just take an average of a group of securities that you're going to have some which are outperforming and some which are underperforming. I guess it's not that amazing when you think about it. There's always going to be ones that are uh, outperforming the index and are benchmarked or average and ones that underperform. So, but it's a great way of looking at that and saying, well, if this is my fixed universe of securities that I can work with, then I have this, uh, this way of being able to take an average of them. And again, I can overweight or maybe take long positions in the ones which are starting to outperform. And this rotation holds. That's the amazing thing about all the work that we've done. And, and you know, I still don't even think that Julius uh, de Campanet really realizes how amazing this chart is and the insights uh, that it can give. So, you know, there's a few things there that we've covered. Um, 
talking about. So I know there's, we've gone very quickly over that, but what I really wanted to do was give you a taste um, of this, uh, a bit of an understanding of this revolutionary, pardon the pun, um, chart style that we have here. Uh, and then just some of the different ways that you can use it and you can start looking at uh, different types of things there. Uh, do go check out those white papers at optima.com slash research. I think you'll find them. There's two there that I've written on RRGs um, about weights and about um, buying out performance being too late. And of course, if you have any questions, you want to try this with your own portfolio, you want to interface um, with uh, Bloomberg portfolios or um, CSV lists or Excel or anything like that, uh, please do let us know. We're here to help however we can. Thank you so much for taking the time. And again, any questions, please let us know.